CPI data was clearly not what some equity investors were hoping for, and short-term rates spiked. We're going to talk about that today on Open Interest. Hello, everybody, and welcome. I'm Mike Co. Welcome to Open Mic, sponsored by Options Play. Uh, tough day for equities today, as most of you will have observed. The principal reason for this was the CPI data. And we'll just take a quick peek at where things came in. I'm not sure if we're going to be able to zoom in on this screen. But uh, the primary economic data that we got today, uh, mortgage applications, but CPI was really what people were looking at. CPI and real average hourly earnings. Um, if we take a look at the CPI year on year, it was came in at 3.5%. The survey was for 3.4%. That doesn't seem like a very big difference, only a tenth. Um, take a look at the month over month numbers, and what we got was 0.4%. Uh, that was both CPI and X Food and Energy. Many will know that they often try to exclude some uh, components of the inflation calculation because they believe that it introduces excessive volatility. A tenth of a percent doesn't seem like that much, but if you annualize that number, that is you multiply it by 12, you will see that you're getting to um, a CPI number that would, if it kept up at this rate, actually be closer to 5% than you know, the target rate of 2%. Bearing in mind that the 2% target rate of inflation that the Fed has in mind is really for the PCE, the personal consumption expenditures uh, deflator, not CPI. And we will be getting that number, by the way, uh, as they usually release that at the end of the month. And tomorrow, we're going to be getting more inflation data. Specifically, we're going to be getting the producer price index data. Um, what are the implications for equities in the midst of all of this? Well, the short version is that any interest rate sensitive areas are going to be particularly hard hit. And among the ones that were particularly hard hit, regional banks, and it was not just because of the rate picture. So let's think about the, how regional banks are affected by something like this and why they would have been among the worst performing sectors. I think KRE, I'm not sure exactly where it was, it was about down 5.5% when I was looking at it for much of the day. Right now, uh, it came off of its lows a little bit, but finished down 5%. What is going on there? Um, so they have a couple of challenges uh, that they are facing. First of all, as many will know, a few of them had a little bit too much duration on their balance sheets. That was problematic. They have greater exposure to commercial real estate than the money center banks do. Um, so the commercial real estate area, specifically office, is very weak. And in fact, we just got some more data points which suggest that office vacancy rates are hitting still all-time highs. So if you have a set of circumstances where also you have an institution that relies on um, basically short-term liabilities in the form of demand deposits, which they do, and the rate that you have to pay for those demand deposits remains high, and you are not you know, collecting more on your longer dated paper, this is really not a good situation. Um, so we've gone over this once before, so let's just talk a little bit about what bank balance sheets look like, how they handle this. So. Very simply, everybody knows how banks work. You collect deposits, you take those deposits, which are, are a short-term liability. A demand deposit is a short-term liability. Um, CDs are also short-term liabilities, but not as immediate because they're not demand deposits. Um, they are liabilities that must be repaid upon demand or you know, in a relatively short period. And then you, so you borrow short and you lend long. Um, you lend in the form of mortgages and things like that. Now, many of these institutions um, were lending aggressively when rates were considerably lower, and those assets are typically held on bank balance sheets, uh, those things that they intend to hold for the duration, 
as held to maturity securities. So they don't get marked down the way if you bought a bond and you were looking at your personal account and said, okay, well, I, I bought long-term treasuries uh, when the 10-year yield was at 67 basis points and now it's at over four. Uh, if you took a look at a 20-year uh, treasury bond in that kind of an environment, you are going to have a significant mark-to-market loss. Regional banks don't display that on their balance sheet on the held to maturity side, um, but we can calculate approximately what those losses would look like if they were forced to sell. Now, under normal circumstances, they may not be forced to sell um, as long as uh, basically the debtors are paying those back. Um, you might say, okay, well, we're going to just assume that those are held to maturity, which is why they call it as such. The problem is that if your assets are long-term bonds that were issued at a time when rates were considerably lower, and your balance sheet, the other side, the liability side, is short-term demand deposits where those rates are considerably higher. And for the regional banks, they do have to be higher because unlike JP Morgan, Bank of America, and, and places like that, um, they actually have more competition for demand deposits because people like to put their money all else equal in institutions that are too big to fail. If an institution is too big to fail, they do not need to pay the same rate of interest on their demand deposits to actually attract them that banks that are not viewed to be too big to fail might have to do. So you get into a situation where uh, you have assets that are not paying you more than what you're paying for your liability side. That is not a comfortable place to be. And if you add to that that you have um, not the greatest commercial loan growth, so uh, CNI loan growth might not be good if people are concerned, if they're hurt by higher rates, and if a lot of your creditors are commercial real estate, specifically office, that is a distressed area. And in many cases, um, they kind of kick the can down the road a little bit. So you had situations where these would probably have been viewed as non-performing earlier than they, than they were, uh, except that they were able to uh, delay, renegotiate, and so on. So that helps account for what we have right now in this space. I think a question we could reasonably ask ourselves is, could this situation get any worse? And I would argue that it could very easily get uh, a bit worse. But rather than trying to press a short on regional banks, I think I'd rather think about what the implications are for equities more generally. And my general sense of that is that uh, almost every equity downturn uh, that you might experience is typically going to be precipitated by uh, credit events. That's usually the case, not always but often it is the case. So when you start to see cracks emerging uh, in the ice underneath your feet on the credit side, that's when you might want to start getting a little bit more concerned about, about equities more generally. And so to that end, I would say, to me, I think the S&P feels a little vulnerable here. Um, so it might be worth considering how one could potentially hedge exposure in that area. So let's just imagine, for the sake of argument, uh, that someone has a portfolio of stocks and you're interested in using uh, options to hedge it. So the first thing you want to do is identify a proxy for your portfolio. So I've just pulled up uh, SPY uh, on options play right here. And I'm using that essentially as, uh, as a proxy. Now, a quick point thing to think about, which is the size of your portfolio, how much of it do you want to hedge, how do you want to do it, uh, that kind of thing. So because every options contract represents 100 shares, if you are looking at something um, like SPY as a, as a proxy, you have to think about it in those increments. Uh, that is to say, in approximately $50,000 increments, because every options contract is going to represent 100 shares, 100 times 50, 514 bucks, so about 51,400 notionally is the, is the way to think about it. How do we hedge it? Um, and actually, we got a question, which I'm, gonna, I'm going to get to, uh, which I think is rather interesting, but um, 
And please, by the way, if you have any questions, put them into the chat or um, you know, do all of that good stuff so that we can we can try to answer them. So you think about it as about fifty thousand dollars notionally. What we actually do because we're often short options against long equity positions, things like that. So essentially in buy rights, covered rights, you know, we have risk reversals and things like that on. And this is largely because you know, our assessment is that even though options premiums are relatively low, that the relationship of, of options premiums on single stocks to index uh, is not so extraordinarily low. So you know, some of these vols are low, but you know, if I'm selling 20, 22% implied volatility on a stock, maybe as much as 30, depending on what the circumstances are, and I'm buying 10, 11, 12 in the index, uh, that I can still uh, achieve something reasonably attractive. Okay, so I alluded to this before, but I don't think I actually went into a, an example of how we might handle something like that. So one of the things we would consider doing as a form of disaster protection is buying, um, you know, let's say a 30 delta put that expires in 30 to 45 days. I'll just go out to May regular way expiration, just keeps things simple. Uh, we're looking at put puts here. So that's gonna be, let's just say the 505s. You know what, 500 is a nice round number. Let's just do that's 24 delta. Okay, so the chances that SPY are going to fall to this level or below by May expiration are not that great by the options market's calculation. You can often use and probably should think of Delta in a couple of ways. One of the ways to think about it is to think about it as um, basically the, the hedge ratio, right? So, and that's going to be important for what I'm about to talk about now. Um, also, you can think about it as the probability that the underlying goes through that strike is, you know, through that strike uh, as of expiration. So, 75% chance by the options markets uh, pricing right now that SPY is above 500 by May expiration. Um, but, you know, if we're concerned about that, then obviously we're still going to be interested in hedging. So, I don't actually go out and just straight hedge the deltas, though. Because you can imagine if you have a portfolio where you're long stocks and you're short options against it, that brings your portfolio delta down a little bit as well. So just imagine I'm long stock. Um, S well, let's just imagine it was SPY. If I'm short and out the money call or just out of it, you know, then I'm not long 100 deltas. I'm actually long cl something closer to 50. Um, and because I often will try to hedge my individual positions if they start to get a little bit out of hand, I actually hedge my hedges too. And what I've been doing is essentially owning SPX options. We're going to just use SPY as an example because uh, I think many people are more familiar with that. Um, but you know the same thing would apply if you're trading SPX options instead. And I actually will true up my deltas each day. What do I mean by that? So if I had bought, now we already owned puts. I have 4750 and 4900 puts in SPX. But basically at the end of each day, I will, against my put position, buy a commensurate delta so that I'm effectively delta neutral in the hedge. And all I'm really looking to do is carry some form of downside disaster protection. So in this particular case, um, you know, you would be buying 24 shares of SPY for every one of these puts that you held. And then tomorrow, you know, what's going to happen is as the market moves around, I'm going to get net longer or shorter as the delta of this option changes. And then I would just true up my deltas again. And what will end up happening when you do this, uh, some people refer to this as scalping your gamma. Um, What's going to end up happening is you are going to essentially pay for some of the decay of that option through time because you're going to be buying stock as it dips, selling it as it rips, and you're going to essentially be paying for a little bit of that optionality. How much you expect to make from that is basically the difference between how much volatility the market is exhibiting and what you paid for the option. 
Um, and then if you're managing the rest of your portfolio along the way, um, you're, you're going to get some offset there. So just something to think about because market corrections, I'm not even talking about a bear market, but market corrections, you know, we typically get one a year or, or more. And that's a 10% pullback. A 10% pullback in the S&P right here, uh, obviously we, you know, are we in one now? I can't say. But, um, you know, 10% pullback from 525 uh, gets you down to, you know, 470-ish, right? So if we are going to see this conflagrate, uh, there is some potential downside here. And, you know, I was actually just talking to somebody today and they said, oh, you know, I don't like to uh, put my hedges on, on a down day. Well, we're down 1%. It's not, not that big a thing. Could it go down 10%? Sure. So um, I wouldn't sit there and say, I'm going to wait until I get an update because when you do that, you might not get a chance. We're still not far off of the all-time highs and, you know, just buy a little bit of downside protection. Why not? And if you think this is too expensive and you don't want to get involved with trying to hedge gamma, which might seem a little bit um, complicated for people who aren't, you know, used to doing that, buy a put spread instead. So, you know, you can, in this case, just say, oh, all right, I'm going to buy that uh, 500 strike put on that 475 level that Mike just talked about, you know, this low delta option. Um, buy that thing. All right, so take a look at this. All right, so that put spread is, you know, we're talking about a, a $25 put spread costs two and a half bucks, right? Pays nine to one. Um, if the market really uh, takes a digger. And here's something else to think about. Okay, so this is disaster protection because it only kicks in at about 500, which is still you know, materially below where we are now. But think about this, $2.5 over the $514 stock price, that's less than 50 basis points. Um, so not terribly expensive to put those kinds of hedges on. Plus, you know, I mean, depending on the construction of your portfolio, it, it can also free up some tradable capital. So I think uh, that's definitely something to, to think about. Okay, so we had a question. It didn't come into um, the application where I can bring it on. Okay, good. So somebody put it up here for me. So Mike, you said that you cover cheap short options first thing every day. What about spreads or options that are just long where you have a loss, say, 50%? Are there any rules you follow? Okay, so I think this is a good, a good question. And actually, it probably will help uh, illustrate, you know, sort of what the construction of our, our portfolio generally looks like. So almost every spread we have um, is more about the overall construction of the book. So to put things in perspective, uh, you know, we're at this point, that just happens to be the way things are setting up. Um, we're mostly short options on single stock. Uh, if we have long options in those names, they're more often than not hedges against the short side. So let me give some examples of what something like that might look like. And maybe I can actually come up with a, a fairly specific uh, example, but let's just let's just look at Meta. Um, this was a trade we're, we're looking at trading uh, Meta today. I don't think we actually ended up putting put, putting this one on the book, but I just want to give an example of what kind of a trade we might typically have on and. Remember that we're going to be long index protection against this. So at the moment, for the most part, we're short options on balance. So short call spreads, short put spreads, maybe long calendar spreads, which is what I'm going to illustrate here um, in the single names. And then we have index protection against it. So basically, if you can imagine that the, the core portfolio single stocks are short options, and then the portfolio has index protection basically to cover the wings, both, both sides, by the way. Okay, so 
What this means is that if I'm long options in Meta, I would most likely be long something longer dated. And let's just quickly check when their, what their event calendar looks like. Um, so probably uh, we're going to look out to at least August. So we've got earnings coming up on April 24th. And then that's estimated, by the way. It's not uh, reported. And the next um, expected earnings for Meta is going to be coming on July 26th. By the way, you know, not for nothing, it was one of the few bright spots today. The stock was actually was actually higher. Okay, so it would not be uncommon for me to say, okay, well, I'm I'm going to take a look at my price target. And let's just say it's, for the sake of argument, um, you know, 5% higher than where the stock currently is. That's going to be 25 bucks higher. I'm just going to round up. So I might be long uh, an upside call on or around the 550 strike. And then short something near dated uh, against it. Now, I've often said that I don't like being in covered calls going into earnings because I believe that that is the time when stocks are most likely to move. New information arrives, and so selling options going into events, you can, you can give away a lot of what it is you ultimately want to have exposure to. The exception to this is typically when I'm in these trades and they do capture earnings. So let's just use um, that 550 target. So now we're looking at uh, a trade like this, up 5%, that's my target. Maybe the implied, and let's actually take a look at what the implied move is. Actually, the implied move, the implied move is actually pretty big. Right now, it looks like it's about 8.4%. Um, so this might not actually be high enough. Uh, let's see. So I don't know that that's where I would go, but I'm certainly going to take 7.5%. So 7.5% of the closing stock price 520 that gets us to actually closer to 560 so i'm actually going to bump this up to 560 here and i might also put this on as a strangle swap um, basically uh, adding some something to the put side so that i could potentially make in either direction if we you know if we get a, a decent sized move so now i'm going to buy that downside put um, you now I skew bullish in Meta for what it's worth, uh, so I'm probably going to choose a strike that's a little tighter on the downside. Maybe 495, down about 5%. And then sell um, that same one here. Okay. Now, the purpose of this illustration wasn't just this trade, which I think is you know a decent trade. Whenever the implied move is you know arguably larger than we anticipate, this is the kind of thing we might do where I would be willing to sell the earnings move. So again, reporting earnings on the 24th, bullish the stock. This is a trade that makes most of its money if it gets to my upside price target. Um, but if it makes you know something close to the implied move on the downside instead, uh, this trade also should do well. Now, bear in mind that there will be some vol crush on that longer dated option. So, you know, arguably this profitability that we're seeing here is is slightly overstated, but it's not going to be that much. And the reason is because that longer dated option is going to continue to to capture another event other than the one that's coming and going. Uh, and that is the uh, earnings, you know, they're going to be reporting their Q2 24 earnings in late July. So this is going to capture that as well. And so what happens here, going to the question, which was, okay, I'm covering short options. So earnings comes, and let's just say that the stock goes up 5% uh, on the 24th. What's going to happen to that upside call option that uh, expires on the 26th, so two days later. So they report on the 24th, it's gonna be in the afternoon, so you really have the 25th and 6th, two days worth of activity. 
Stock goes to 540 for the sake of argument. What's going to happen? Well, the, the high implied volatility in that April 26 option is just going to get crushed. So that all of that event fall is going to come right out. Um, so now you're going to be dealing with a, a short option that is $20 out of the money with two days to go. And vol, which right now, implied volatility for the 26th is, let's see what it is. So for the 26th, implied volatility is 56. All right. What is implied volatility for Meta under normal circumstances that don't capture earnings like that? 29, maybe 30. So that means that almost half of the extrinsic value of the option, all else equal, is going to come out simply as a function of that vol crush on that day after. So very likely, that would be an option that I would be covering um, on that Thursday or whatever, right? Um, the 25th, right after they report. What about other options? So the, uh, the 495 puts are completely dead at that point in that scenario. Um, they're way out of the money, and there's no vol left. So the April 26, 495s, those, you could also cover those, probably would. You can probably get them back for whatever, a dime or something like that on the 25th. What about those August 495 puts, though? So those August 495 puts are going to have lost uh, a decent bit of money in this scenario for three reasons. One, um, a couple weeks have passed, so there is some theta element to that. Two, in the scenario that I've just described, the stock which is currently trading 520 is up 20 bucks. So even just on a delta basis, even if that was immediate, we can actually see that right here. Um, you can just imagine, okay, well, what if it was up 20 bucks? Well, you can kind of approximate that and say, all right, well, that's going to be about $8 alone uh, just in delta that it's going to have lost. Um, so that $33 option is, you know, $32 option to keep the math easy is $24. It's two weeks shorter to expiration now than it was. And some vol is going to come out of it as well. Um, so with all of those three things combined, an option that I paid $32 for is now probably going to be uh, closer to 20, right? So it's going to have lost nearly 13 bucks of its current value. That's okay because remember I sold a $13 put against it and I wanted the stock to go higher, which it has done. Uh, what do I do with that 495 put? It hasn't lost the 50% you were talking about. So this is the interesting part. I'm not making a determination about what I do with that option based on how much its value has changed. I make a determination about what to do with that option based on what I'm going to do next. So I only owned that so I could sell the 495 puts, like I own the 560 calls so I could sell those 560 calls. So the question now becomes, do I want to continue to shoot against it? What do I mean by that? Do I now want to sell May regular way? 495 puts or 490 puts uh, against it. Well, that depends a little bit on what the implied volatility is, but if I'm getting you know something close to the same level, so maybe I own those puts and they're 32, 33 vol at this point, and I can sell something pretty close to that against it, sure, I'll, I'll probably do that. If I don't find something favorable to sell against it though, I'm now gonna make the determination to sell that option because I'm not using it. I'm not in the business of simply buying puts and then hoping, oh, gee, maybe the stock goes down. I mean, I have a bullish view on Meta, so I certainly wouldn't do that. Um, whether or not I hold my long options based on whether they've decayed or appreciated depends more on whether I am using them to sell something else against it. Um, and that's really the only thing I'm thinking about. Just like some of these other options I've held, I you know that I've been trading the gamma on the SPX. Uh, SPX, I think the 5,500 calls that expire at the end of April 30th, which are a part of my larger gamma hedge. And that option's like a 55 cent option. I don't remember what I paid for it at the time when I rolled into those, but it was probably eight nine bucks. Um, but I really haven't been thinking about the decay in that option because I'm trading a gamma around it. It doesn't really, you know, it's something I get to lean on. 
Uh, and same thing is true here. So um, if you are using them as part of a spread and you can still spread against them, then that's really the principal issue. Are you getting a positive rate of return on that trade? Okay. On the other hand, if I make a directional bet, um, and this isn't the most common thing for me to do, but if I make a directional bet uh, going into earnings by, say, buying calls or, or buying call spreads, um, and it goes against me, what is my rule set for getting out of it? Believe it or not, here too, I'm not so much thinking about the value of uh, the option as a function of how much I paid for it. Instead, I'm actually taking a look at the underpinning thesis. So Delta reported earnings. If I, I actually did have a couple of calls on, but it was not because I was making a directional bet in Delta and earnings. Basically what was going on was I, it seemed like there was a mismatch on when the options market was actually expecting earnings originally. And so I had owned what I thought would capture earnings and been short things that were bid up against it. Um, so if I own long call options and I'm expecting a bullish move and it doesn't happen, I actually will just blow the trade out. It almost doesn't matter what the price of it is. In, in that situation, if the thesis was a directional bet you, and you get that directional bet wrong, your first loss is usually your best loss. It is far, far too easy to come up with a new narrative to justify a trade rather than you know, simply take the pain and say, you know what, I got that one wrong. Um, and I, I'm pretty unapologetic about doing that. And the reason is because we've got so many things that I'm trading on any given day, you know, probably 50 names in the portfolio. There's you know, multiple legs per stock. There's just no way I can allow myself to be distracted by things where I made a bet, got it wrong, and now I'm still trying to manage it. That, that's just not a productive use of time. So the way I think about it, if you're making a directional bet, especially on a news-related uh, event, that event comes and it goes, and you have it wrong, just blow the thing out. Um, really as simple as that. OK, um, so let's take a look. Where do we find, Anil asks, where do we find the expected move of stocks? OK, uh, well, the first thing is you can, you can calculate it yourself if it's a near dated event. It's a little more complicated if it's longer dated. But if it's a near dated event, the simplest way to do it is just to look at the, at the money straddle. So we've got a bunch of financials that are reporting this week. Um, makes it really easy, right? We've, there's only uh, two trading days left in the week, and we've got uh, JP Morgan is going to be reporting uh, pre-open on Friday. And uh, you say, well, what's the implied move? OK, well, I'm just going to, I'll go in the app here. But you know, on your broker's platform or whatever, easy enough. Um, just take a look at the at the money straddle. So, J and I'm talking about the one that expires uh, this week. So I'm just going to. Advance. Here we are. Uh, the twelfth stock closed one ninety five forty seven. So the one ninety five calls and puts. That's probably is uh, closest we're going to get. So I've got both mid market. Um, add the two together. There's your answer. So the calls went out mid market about three seventy eight. Um, puts went out three twenty eight. So we're looking at $7.06, give or take, right? So 706 over 195, and there's your answer, 3.6%. Um, put things in perspective, the, over the last 11 years, so 44 reported quarters, the average one-day move for JP Morgan is just under 2%. Um, we're actually a day before so you could actually say, well, maybe I should be looking at the average move from one day prior to you know, the close thereafter. That average is 2.6. Not a stock that moves a whole heck of a lot um, when they report earnings. So 2.6% over the last 44 reported quarters is the average. Um, and the biggest move we've seen recently actually came last April. 
Uh, was it last April? Last April, JP Morgan rallied 8% following earnings. And let's see how far off the highs we are here. This one fell back a little bit. An 8% move would, pro oh, that would take us to fresh highs, wouldn't it? 2.11? Yeah, uh-uh. I don't think so. Um, it's, it's been a heck of a run for these things. I mean, JP Morgan, which I, you know, I mean, I, I'm not unique in saying this. I mean, I think they're the best run of the money center banks. And why do I say that? Let me be a little bit more specific. Um, I think they've been very wise and opportunistic. They have great exposure to sales trading and investment banking. Um, they did not take a lot of duration on. They have not had the controversies that Wells Fargo has had with respect to shenanigans involving opening you know, unapproved accounts and things like that. So basically, a lot of the stumbles that other banks have experienced, they haven't done it. Uh, is it Jamie Dimon? Is it the people he hires? Is it a culture at the bank? Um, is it by virtue of the fact that they tend to attract, I mean, it's probably one of the most appealing places to work if you're going to go into finance is to go work for J.P. Morgan. That was not necessarily the case when I was getting out of um, college. You know, everybody thought Goldman Sachs or, you know, one of the big hedge funds like Tiger, those, those were the places to go. But, um, and Morgan Stanley has pivoted. So Morgan Stanley was a white shoe investment bank. They've really um, focused more on asset management. JP Morgan also has a decent asset management business too. So they touch all of the key business areas. Um, they also have a great uh, consumer business and that consumer business like American Express skews to the higher end of the socioeconomic demographic and that means that they have better credit quality. So you, you, there's almost no aspect of banking that they are in where they don't do it at least as well or better than the next guy. Um, so I think that's one of the reasons. And of course, Bank of America has this really ugly duration problem that they got onto their balance sheet, which almost seems inexcusable, I have to say. Um, six, seven duration on, you know, epic, on record low rates. I don't, I don't understand how they could have done that, but Whatever. Um, it just seems hard for me to imagine after the run we've seen from the high 130s in late October um, that we're going to see JP Morgan go a whole lot higher out of earnings. And not because I don't like the bank, and I, I do like it. It's just that uh, I think it's, it's getting fairly fully priced. Um, and also, it's just likely to bump its head um, with the run that we've had if it gets back up to that level. Uh, the peak valuation, we look, at, we look at banks, so not price to earnings. I mean, th these are hugely levered balance sheets. So, um, you know, we usually like to think about it on price to book, price to tangible book. This is just a price to book chart. And we can see that, you know, going back over the last couple of years, this is, it's getting up there um, almost two times, right? So... We saw this in 2021. So is there a little bit more room to the upside? Uh, possibly, but, but take a look at how little room there is. To get to that peak valuation, call it two times, um, that's really not far from where we are right now. That's 4.2% higher than the stock, and that's basically the all-time high which we recently hit. Okay. Um, so yeah, look at the straddle to calculate the expected value. Um, why do you use SPY instead of SPX for protection for uh, a large portfolio? Is it for the bid-ask spread? You need 10 times the puts. Okay, well, uh, actually, I do use SPX. I was using SPY as an example because uh, it's easier to pull up, and I think a lot of people are more familiar with the, um, with the ETF. Personally, uh, I use SPX in my own portfolio and, and for the portfolio that I manage. Um, we use SPX, not, not SPY options. Um, but look, it, it, to this, you know, to PC's question here, SPX might not be the best uh, hedge for everybody because the notional value of one contract is a half a million dollars, right? So it's a 100 multiplier 
SPX is whatever, 5150 or thereabouts as of today's close. So that times 100, $515,000. Um, maybe, you know, trading SPX options isn't uh, the appropriate size for some people. And SPY options are deeply, deeply liquid. Make no mistake, I've seen plenty of institutions use SPY options. Um, you know, I, I saw people trading those 10, 15, 20,000 contracts at a clip. So they're highly liquid. Um, notionally, SPX open interest is larger than SPY, um, but SPX is notionally, it's, it's the biggest options open interest there is. Um, you don't need to worry about, in fact, actually, let's just take a look. You know, how many options traded in SPY today? Um, you know, it measures in the millions, I'm sure. 9.24 million contracts. There's 22 million open interest. And actually, on the bid ask spread point, this is kind of an interesting one. The lit market, which is the bid ask spread that you actually see on the screens, is tighter in SPY than it is in SPX. That's not an issue for me uh, when it comes to trading SPX options because you can trade them in the middle all day. I mean, they, they trade reasonably tight as it is, but you can trade them in the middle. Uh, and when we, you know, I don't do this anymore. I don't use phone orders into the SPX pit, but you know, I used to have a dedicated broker who was in the SPX pit. And you know, the SPX options market is a very fairly priced market uh, on the wire. You, know, you, you get somebody down there um, working your order for you and you will trade within the screens. You know, you're trading very close to the middle most of the time. But it's not necessary these days because you can trade SPY, this thing is going to be a penny wide. You know, you don't need to get on the phones and, you know, call up a, a floor broker or anything like that anymore. Uh, unless, you know, you're an institutional trader working huge size. Uh, okay. Uh, let's see here. SPYs and QQQs. Okay, fair enough. Um, that, I don't know if that was a question, just a comment, or whether... Um, seven-figure mission here is referring to using one or the other. But the fact of the matter is you also can tailor the underlying instrument that you use to your portfolio. So not everybody is going to have a portfolio that looks exactly like uh, SPY. If you have a, a book that's mostly energy stocks, you can use XLE, Industrials XLI. If you have a lot of healthcare names, uh, if you have a lot of healthcare, managed care in particular, I feel very sorry because uh, UNH, Humana, all of that, those were very, very hard hit last week. Actually, you know, that's kind of an interesting point too. Um, I've been wondering about this because I feel a bit as if um, a lot of the bad news has been baked into the cake for some of these stocks. I've mentioned this before. Um, you know, this seems like kind of a critical juncture. And in fact, I, I think this is exactly, I was on uh, Fast Money, I think, I don't know, was it Monday this week? It might've been last Friday. I think I was on last Friday. And I think UNH, uh, United Health was my, my final trade. And I mentioned, you know, trading it with a tight stop. I don't use stops that often. My thinking here is that you've got this antitrust business that, is going to keep a lid on it, um, a lot of other sort of bad news. But on a valuation basis, we have not seen too many circumstances where you've been able to get um, a business that has been growing the bottom line consistently in the double digits. You know, we're talking about 12, 15% EPS growth year in, year out where you've been able to get something like that for a below market multiple, at just frankly, a reasonable multiple, right? So full year estimated adjusted EPS, as we can see here, about 27.60 a share at 450. I mean, you're looking at 16 times full year earnings and $30 billion worth of free cash flow. Um, fifth, less than 15 times full year 2025. So why the, the um, so why the tight stop and why was I sort of referring to this 450 level as being kind of critical? The only reason is that, you know, the, 
very definition of value traps. This is not a value trap because actually it's not a shrinking company. But um, fundamentals, and I say this all the time, it's one of the critical components to the stocks that we buy. Um, but we do pay a lot of attention to price action. And the reason we pay attention to, to price action is because fundamentals just as important as they are, uh, they give you a basis for the decisions you're making. You can help select one security over another. Uh, fundamentals are just not a phenomenal trading tool. You can't use PE ratios um, and EPS growth as a trading signal, generally speaking. Um, so I happen to like UNH. I, you know, I was. We are short puts in it. Um, and that is made possible in part by the fact that some of the recent stress that the company has been under has meant that they've caught a little bit of a bid. So what you'll see here, this right, uh, this chart is just simply a chart of the three price of three month options in uh, United Health, and you can see that um, it's higher, um, and that there's good reason for that. But uh, I think that's kind of uh, interesting. Okay, your opinion about copper mining stocks like FCX, Freeport, Mac, Moran, sustainable fundamentals for a 40 PE. Thanks. Uh, okay, well, why don't we take a look at, uh, let's take a look at Freeport. Uh, actually, we can take a look at it over here and uh, we'll do it first in, in options play. Um, I'm assuming that part of the reason for the question is, I mean, look, we've had a lot of stocks that have rallied sharply off of uh, the October um, October lows. This is one of those. Um, and it is up quite a lot. Uh, let me see if I can blow this up. We can get a better look. Um, I do actually think um, there is, I do think this is a bit sustainable. I've talked about this not in sort of the uh, industrial metals and mining area like copper and, and so on. Uh, obviously, the precious metals, which were hard. Precious metals, you know, gold got hit today. Uh, this, just as a quick aside, should not come as a surprise to anybody. Um, sometimes it's counterintuitive. People say, oh, we got higher than expected uh, inflation data, and therefore we're expecting something like the precious metals to rise, and yet they fall. Why is that? The reason that they are falling is because when you get that inflation data, the expectation is that if there was an anticipated rate cut, you're not going to get it, or maybe you're going to get a rate hike. Higher rates, which helps depress inflation and also raises the essentially carry cost of the metal, um, so they kind of move in opposite directions, right? So if you see rates higher, then you might expect to see the precious metals uh, lower. Uh, with respect to Freeport, um, not growing the top line at uh, a hugely fantastic rate. Uh, the street is expecting considerably better free cash flow coming out of the company. My thinking is that if I was going to continue to press a bullish bet in here that and this is, you know, another quick point. This is one of those things where you do see higher um, implied volatilities in a name like this. This is the kind of space where I, I will oftentimes think about using things like uh, call spread risk reversals. Um, so that's basically where you're, you're buying an upside call spread, financing that by selling downside puts using it as a replacement for stock. If you have stock, that's a possibility. Uh, you could always just buy calls, but I think they're a little bit on the pricey side. Um, or as an alternative, if you don't already own it. Um, so uh, in this particular case, uh, going out to July might be a little bit long, but I'm just going to use this for the purposes of illustration because I think it can be helpful uh, just to show you um, you know, what, what you can get. Um, so we can say, let's see, the stock was about 51 bucks. Uh, it's a little difficult here because 
you know, it's it's tricky sometimes when the strikes aren't right there, but we're going out in time. But and what do I mean by that? You know, I can buy a 50 strike call, which is in the money. Don't usually prefer it. I like to have a little bit of convexity in the trade. And also I'm trying to put the thing on it at relatively low cost. So I could buy the 55 call, sell the 60s, um, and then look to sell uh, something that will help finance most of that. Maybe the 45 puts will get me there. Looks like it will. Sure enough. Okay. So what do we end up with? We end up with a structure that looks like this. Um, the idea here is that you know I'm going to get some bullish exposure. Downside is that I'm going to be put the stock at 45 bucks. That's down six bucks from here. Um, not going to give me all the protection all the way back down to where the stock was, uh, you know, just recently. But it is a discount. Uh, six bucks on a fifty dollars stock. That's a, a significant discount. And bear in mind that those wing options will decay. Uh, a bit more rapidly than the longer dated than the uh, at the money option that you're purchasing. In this case, it's not really at the money; it's the 55s. But still, um, I think I prefer this to uh, chasing the stock here, um, and also as a potential su stock substitute if you if you own it. Um, and by the way, this is probably something which you may not have thought about. Uh oh, I just realized the time. Um, but if you own the stock and you buy a um, put spread against it, you're going to end up with uh, a very similar profile. I have chewed up about an hour of your time, and I really appreciate your time and patience. Like, subscribe, put your comments in, and I will look to answer them. And I see some questions about Apple, uh, so maybe I'll respond to this Apple uh, question in the comment section after I get off of CNBC, which is what I'm going to be doing right after this. Thank you very much for watching.